know, I think in practice, we've been doing this already when someone is on refractory, um, you know, we, we have our set of options that we want to move to. And I really think the, the NCCN is reflecting what we're doing in practice. Um, however, I do believe that we can, we don't necessarily always have to uh, class switch. So I, I, I think patients do very well um, going from lenalidomide to pomalidomide. Um, so that I, I think that remains a good option for patients as well. Um, another thing I'll say about uh, the updates in the NCCN guidelines um, is that I, we still do recycle um, daratumumab and the anti-CD38 uh, monoclonal antibodies. So that's something I think we're still going to practice, um, you know, in, in our setting. Um, and one other thing, well, regarding the updates, I'm happy to see that they do have, um, you know, supportive care um, guidelines, especially for infections. Um, it's including IVIG now for patients who uh, with IgG levels below 400. Um, so no, I think this will help us get these uh, therapeutics um, supportive care options through insurances a little more easily. So Selenexor remains um, a great option for patients, um, even after one prior line of therapy. Um, you know, over a 70% pers um, response rate in patients, uh, especially after one prior line of therapy and len refractory. Um, you know, with the, the Selenexor, I think, you know, as a practice, we're not starting patients at the highest dose, 100 milligrams. You know, it's, I think it's important with this regimen um, to start low and go slow. Um, the side effects are really dose dependent. So I, I think like if we want success on this regimen, um, we really need to titrate the dose to a patient's tolerance. And I see like, even in my own practice, that when we do start at these lower doses, not really compromising the efficacy um, of this, this regimen. And we see also the studies uh, did show um, in, in cohorts that this can also potentially benefit high-risk patients. So I think this is a, a good regimen uh, option for patients, um, especially after that uh, LEN refractory first line of therapy going right into the second line of therapy. So with Selenexor, it's an oral, um, it's an oral regimen. You know, we, we get these medications through specialty pharmacies um, and Chiropharm, which is the maker of Selenexor, um, they have an assistance program, starter packs that they can send patients. So we can easily start patients on therapy, then they're going to their local um, community setting to get either a Velcade injection um, as part of the regimen. So I think this is a good regimen for patients uh, who are, like I like to say, geographically challenged. You know, they, they can go in conveniently for a Velcade injection and take the Selenexor at home. With Selenexor, it's a lot of GI side effects. So nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, and these are very dose dependent. So prior to initiating uh, Selenexor, I'm making sure that I, my patients have um, two antiemetics um, at home. Uh, so usually I'm gonna prescribe indiancitrone and um, Zyprexa uh, to manage the, um, the nausea. But I find also really the best strategy to manage the nausea is um, is really dose, like I said, dose dependent. Um, so I don't start patients at the highest dose. We, we start at the lowest dose. Um, and I find that most patients actually then only really require one antiemetic, but I do give patients the two antiemetics. If they're tolerating the dose, um, we, can, we can dial back some of the antiemetics, but really with endansetrone and a lower dose, um, I'm managing patients quite well on it, but you want to make sure that patients do have that two antiemetics on board. Okay, so the Boston trial, the key um, t 
takeaways that we learned from the Boston trials that we did see a significant uh, progression-free survival in that triplet on with selenexer, bortezomib, and dexamethasone. Um, and, you know, we did see some deep responses um, observed in that, in that therapy. So, you know, 44% of patients really achieved that uh, VGPR better. And overall response rate, over 75% uh, of patients. And we see that patients start responding quickly. So within a month, um, patients start responding and durable responses. So um, patients will remain in response for over 20 months. So deep responses, quick responses, durable responses. You know, we're all excited that we have these new novel therapies um, with the bispecific antibodies and the CAR-T therapies. Uh, you know, CAR-T therapies, there's still um, some concern for access of patients who geographically are not near a CAR-T center. But these bispecific antibodies are offering similar, um, you know, outcomes from what we're seeing in CAR-T. So, you know, that might eliminate some of the accessibility to these therapies, but we're seeing patients who've had multiple prior lines of therapy, uh, heavily relapsed refractory patients, um, and we're seeing patients now um, achieve very stringent remissions and durable remissions. I have patients on bispecific antibodies that are over five years in a complete remission, um, you know, still doing very well. And with our CAR T therapies, you know, it's it's a I like to say a one and done. Even though you know we still uh, support patients with supportive care uh, throughout, but you know they're they're having a CAR T treatment. It's a living drug essentially, um, so that you know they get one treatment and then they're treatment free for several years. Uh, again, I have patients well over five years uh, disease free uh, post CAR T therapy. So there's a lot of excitement. Um, you know, the FDA recently now approved these CAR T therapies in earlier lines. Uh, so, you know, more patients should have access to these therapies um, because prior they were they were um, approved in later lines of therapy. Um, and we know attrition rate from one line to the next drops significantly. So now we can offer these novel therapeutics um, to a, a larger uh, patient population.